Ladies and gents, Omrushi Jubiak, and this is the Article of Confederation: Becoming the United States, Extra Shoot Part One by the Channel Extra Grades. Yeah, <clears throat> I was doing Operation Barbosa yesterday, but then I realized that's the same thing as the Eastern Front from World War Two. I didn't know that before reacting to that. I'm still doing the history uh, series from that, right? History Channel. So I'm gonna do that when I'm done with that because otherwise it's the same thing. It feels weird. So yeah, the Article of Confederation. When the 13 colonies of North America broke away from Great Britain, they struggled to draft their first constitution. After great debate, they created the Article of Confederation and formed the United States of America. All right. Yeah, I don't know much about the history of, you know, earlier days of United States. Just the basic that everybody knows, not in detail. So this is going to be a fun video. I've worked quite a few historical videos already. If you haven't seen them, check out the cards of the playlist. Check out the history with all my historical videos. Uh, check out the playlist too, like Oli Sakashi Production, Oversimplified, uh, CGP Grey, Kazakhstan in a nutshell. And yeah, let's watch this one. The United States Constitution created a republic that has lasted for well over 200 years, but it was not the first national government of the United States of America. That distinction goes to the short-lived Articles of Confederation, without which the Constitution as it exists today might never have been formed. The British Parliament had just about had it with their American colonists. First, they ran up enormous debts fighting the French, which respectable enough, I guess, but they now refused to pay the taxes that would fund it, and they even had the gall to argue that Parliament had no right to issue taxes to them at all. And now some radicals in Boston had ruined an entire shipment of taxable goods in a shocking disregard for tea. Parliament weighed their options and decided to take a risk. They would punish Boston and the entire colony of Massachusetts, making an example of them to warn other colonies against taking similar rebel actions. They shut down Boston Harbor and revoked the Massachusetts colony's right to govern itself. But there was a problem with Parliament's carefully considered, surgically precise retaliation. I it sucked. After all, there were still many Americans who were loyal to the crown. Their loyalty sprang not from a fear of punishment, but from a genuine and even patriotic belief that the British government was the best government on earth yeah. because it guaranteed representation and rights and all these wonderful things that Parliament had just deemed necessary to strip away. But yeah, Boston Tea Party, you know, you know, all the things happened. Basically, it happened because they wanted, uh, you know, equal rights, right? taxation you know without representation that was the issue so they just wanted representation right so there were lots of people who didn't want to you know go independent but just wanted to you know i guess if, if they're going to tax us you know we you know we should have a voice there basically that's what the issue was and then so, you know after that the handling of that by uh, king george basically that turned into independence movement but the radicals and the loyalists were united in one belief, that a display of American unity would help Parliament and King George III reconsider the justice of these acts and repeal them. Delegates from the colonies convened at a Continental Congress in 1774 to draft a nice, thoughtful letter explaining their objections and asking Parliament to kindly repeal these laws. By the end of the week, though, what had been originally intended as a gentle letter of friendship had transformed into an open rebuke and a vow to embargo British goods. Many of the delegates cheered this display of resolve. One, shouting to be heard above the cheers, warned that this act would be a declaration of war. Nobody listened. They were too busy congratulating themselves on the inevitable capitulation of Great Britain. But just in case, they did agree to reconvene in half a year if Parliament didn't meet their demands. Half a year later, shots had been fired, and the American Revolutionary War was underway. So the Continental Congress met again. Despite- <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a British Empire. Of course, something like that would cause the war. So that guy is like, uh, am I the only one who's seeing this, right? Am I the only one who can see this coming? Everything that had happened, those who had been loyal to the crown still held out hope for peace. They decided to write another letter, because that first one had just worked so well, but this time they would write directly to the king, and promise that they were still loyal and totally understood that his bad ministers had led him astray. King George refused to even read this letter, and declared all the colonies to be in open rebellion. So, O for two on the letter thing. <laughs> They're like, all the minister led you astray, it's like, you do know me, right? You do know who I am, right? 
It didn't help that at the same time Congress had been drafting this petition for peace, they had also mustered a continental army, appointed a general by the name of George there Washington, and begun to organize armed resistance. Many loyalists saw this as a necessary act of self-defense. Radicals saw it as the first step toward American independence. The idea of independence had begun... <laughs> All the lawyers said, oh, this is, oh, everything's going so swimmingly, right? This is just defense. And George Washington was like, yeah, yeah, sure it is. ...to gain popularity, but the delegates of the Continental Congress could not act on it. Not only did many still hope to reconcile with Great Britain, but they also had to answer to the governments in their home colonies, and their governments said, absolutely not. Nope, do not even think about declaring independence. Yeah. Once again, the time was ripe here for a thoughtful, strategic intervention by British Parliament. And once again, they did not miss the opportunity. They announced a blockade of all 13 colonies, and effectively expelled them from the Empire. The last hope for reconciliation was snuffed out. The colonies... Yeah, nobody wanted independence at that point. People were like, don't even speak of it. That was the thing, like, you know, it's a British Empire, let's not even go there, right? Uh, people were still, you know, holding hopes that, you know, maybe everything will be fine, everything could be peaceful. But the way British Empire, you know, handled it, you know, the way King George basically handled it, sooner, you know, some of the letters, I don't know, who was the guy? I, I'm, I'm forgetting that, I was always simply very real, that guy who you know, basically wrote about independence and it became one of the best selling thing in the America even today, right? Basically, he just spread these pamphlets and, you know, it just became an independence movement. Stopped being colonies and instead became self-governing states. They threw out their old systems of government and the loyalists who ran them and wrote new state constitutions. Their delegates at the Continental Congress received new instructions. Please, yes, do declare independence now. Heck, Rhode Island got so excited it declared itself an independent nation before anybody else could. Swept up in the enthusiasm for state building, in the summer of 1776, the Continental Congress resolved to declare independence, seek foreign allies, and write a constitution. Ideas for a constitution that brought the colonies together in an alliance had been floating around for decades, but the most influential model had come from Benjamin Franklin, a philosopher, statesman, and hobby kite enthusiast. Franklin had yeah. become fascinated by the Haudenosaunee, Native American peoples who had formed a confederacy of six nations. Their leader saw an echo of his own people's divided past in the British colonies and urged them to form a confederacy of their own. This idea had sparked... By the way, Franklin at the time was one of the most famous scientists of the world. He wasn't just, uh, you know, some of the founding father, that's why he's apparently famous and he was also a scientist. No, he was pretty damn famous scientist of his time, right? He did pretty significant things. So it's not surprising they were smart enough to think all these things. Barked Franklin's immense curiosity. He embarked on a study of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, European models of government, and even colonial alliances from the early days of settlement. In 1754, he had met with delegates from other colonies and laid out his Plan of Union, which synthesized elements of the governments that he'd studied into a uniquely American vision. The delegates enthusiastically adopted it. They brought it home to their governments, and their governments, just as enthusiastically, threw it out. The colonies had wanted to be able to determine their own fates, at least as far as Parliament would let them. Franklin's plan asked them to give up some of their political power to a central legislature, which would control their foreign affairs, creating yet another unwanted layer of supervision to get in their way. No thank you. But Franklin continued working on this plan. When he joined the second... Yeah, I, you know, lots of videos I've reacted to, people constantly tell me that... United States is not much of a country, it's just a, you know, union of state, United State, right? So all the states have the real power, why, you know, the federal government is just there, right? Yeah, okay, maybe that's how we kind of started. But first of all, let's talk about that, right? Even here, people like, you know, through the Benjamin Franklin's idea, basically just like, we want to be independent. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll do the way we want. States have the past. Then states are their own countries. That is no one unified country, right? Then the, each state is country and they are weak if they are not unified. You could argue that they could have some kind of a kind of a friendship type union whenever the shit goes down basically they act as a one country but you can never enforce it because there is no central main government no federal government at that point if the states act like uh, countries so you know that in itself is an issue but nowadays obviously people basically tells me 
that United States is still that that union of states and not a proper country as any every other countries are. Basically, states have the real power and things like that. Yeah, not really, because federal government has the you know army under them, the biggest powerful army of the world. Supreme courts, nobody can refuse Supreme Court regardless of which state you are. <clears throat> you can create your own laws and things, but Supreme Court can easily overrule you. So yeah, it started as that, and some you know at certain level. Uh, states also act like that they create their own law and different thing if you're trying to travel in the United States from state to state drive there you need to know about laws of every different state I understand that but that's just like you know uh, a bit of freedom here and there otherwise it's a proper country Supreme Court can overrule anything and nobody can do anything about it and federal government is the one who has the real army president has the real army so, yeah, at the start, they're like, okay, we don't want this kind of a government, you know, central government type of thing. We just want state. But that's just like, you know, in a, in, a, in a free world, there has to be somewhat compromise in every size. Otherwise, it's just way too Wild West type of thing where there is no central government. There is no nothing. Everybody governs themselves. That could go pretty chaotically soon. And, you know, there is no unifying force that could unite all the states. So some other country comes and attacks, that might be problematic. So you need a you know, central government, you need a fed, federal government at that point. In Continental Congress in 1775, he revised it and presented it as a plan for how this multi-state Congress should be organized. They had basically been winging it for the last yeah. year, coasting off of popular approval and the indulgence of the colonies, but they had no official grant of authority. Franklin thing is if you just you know just have the like we don't want federal government which is going to be free right all the states are going to be free and we'll do it our way and you know if the some uh, enemy comes we'll just you know basically take charge our own you know uh, we all we all will unify basically but there is no guarantee to that right somebody could have idea like ah we, we don't want to have a part in that fight some states want to fight some states don't and there is always going to be disagreements and it could go to cha full-on chaos basically so you need a one central government right you can have freedom every states can have freedom but you still need a federal government that ties everything in creates one singular country hoped to fix that but he had acted just a bit too early the independence movement needed about another year to warm up to the idea of a constitution, so his proposal was pushed aside again. Okay, so now fast forward back to where we were in 1776. At last, the pendulum is swinging in favor of a constitution to spell out the rights and responsibilities of the Continental Congress. An unlikely man takes the helm. John Dickinson, who has been a vocal loyalist, staunchly opposed to both independence and revolution. Yet he has also led the way for both of them. His newspaper articles about the need to resist British taxation through non-violent boycotts had shaped the early stages of colonial resistance. And since then, he's authored so many documents on behalf of the Congress that he'll later be known as the penman of the revolution. Yeah. Dickinson fears that the states aren't yet ready to govern themselves without the protections of British law. Seeing many of his fellow delegates argue for independence before they even have a constitution only makes him more convinced that they haven't thought through what independence requires. So he volunteers to lead the committee to draft a constitution and get things started right. He blows the dust off of Benjamin Franklin's plan and takes the name from the top of the page, Articles of Confederation. But this new country needs a better name than the United Colonies of North America. They're not colonies anymore, they're states. How about the United States of America? Ah. Over the next few weeks, Dickinson... So Dickinson named the country, huh? Dickinson leads the creation of a new constitution and updates Franklin's work with his own ideas. He replaces the backbone of British law with a central legislature that has authority over the states. He guarantees civil rights at the national level and restricts foreign policy decisions to his new Confederation Congress. He's almost ready to submit his final draft when the moment he feared so much arrives. The Declaration of Independence is ready to go, and Congress must vote on whether or not to sign it. Dickinson does his best to block the vote, arguing that the states must ratify a constitution first. How can they declare independence when they don't even have a national government? The other delegates scoff at this idea. They don't need a national government. The states have been doing just fine on their own. Just as Franklin found 20 years earlier, the states still do not want to give up their power to us. Yeah, and knowing that they are, you know, fighting British at that point, and British are known for divide and conquer uh, strategy. 
you know, if there is no, you know, basically a constitution and something that unifies all the states while well, they just, you know, they're just winging it. They're just doing improv. That could prove disaster if, it, you know, full scale war starts with Britain and the colonies and they don't have some kind of a central government at that point. Central legislature. After all, the whole point of this revolution was to get rid of British Parliament. Why would they rush to put some other power in its place? The vote for independence goes to the... F yeah, but it would be central government that is democratic. You would have a say in that too, right? It's just uh, one, uh, let's just say one committee, one, you know, meeting place where every state decide what is good for everybody. It's not monarchy. Floor. Everybody except Dickinson votes yes. He can't vote yes in good conscience, and he won't vote no to undermine the unanimous support from the other delegates. Instead, he resigns from Congress, his reputation in ruins, and he goes to serve in the war. Without Dickinson to defend it, the Articles of Confederation he drafted gets torn to pieces. The strong central legislature he proposed gets demoted to an advisory board. Civil rights protections disappear. This Congress will have no power over the state and has to trust them to fund it voluntarily. Congress does get to keep the power to make foreign treaties, but it'll have no way to enforce them. Seriously. It is this version of the Articles of Conf- I mean, if it's just an advisory board and, you know, all the states has to agree, like, okay, fine, you have power right now. But so, you know, if, it, if it's not enforceable, uh, yeah. Federation, so different than what Dickinson wrote over a year ago, that finally gets sent to the states for ratification. And even that will prove much more difficult than expected. Yeah, United States Constitution is really complex and all the events happened to reach that point is it's gonna be awesome. So I'm gonna love this series. Because it definitely shaped uh, the how the you know United States of America became. Especially how there is no mention of God in the Constitution, right? Because the you know founding fathers knew that uh, all the people who might get you know uh, basically ran away from their country because you know they couldn't you know, they couldn't do their own religion, they might uh, have an issue if we put any mention of God. So it's you know the Constitution is basically godless. So you can you know you can practice any religion you want that kind of thing. So it's really complex and you know detailed. Alright people, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like and subscribe, check out the reaction, there's a link in the description, check out the cards of different places, the link cards, and I'll see you next time.